Hello and welcome to this low-level JavaScript series on building a 16-bit virtual machine. Today I want to introduce a new concept. It's called the stack. And really it's not very much more than a little abstraction over memory. But this little abstraction does serve a very important purpose in the machine. So what exactly is a stack? Essentially, it's a region of memory along with a pointer. And by pointer, all I mean is an address that we can keep track of that essentially says, this is where the stack is right now. We can use this region of memory to temporarily store state. And as we interact with the stack, the pointer moves around. The movement of the pointer is taken care of by special instructions that we can use to manipulate the stack. In this first very brief glance, maybe you're thinking that doesn't actually sound very useful. At least not more useful than just using memory any way we want. After all, right now, we have full access and control of memory, so why complicate things? This might be true, but today we're going to look at two things that the stack really excels at. And since everything is a trade-off, you can decide for yourself whether you think it's worth the effort. The first of these two things is dealing with temporary values. The second is how it helps us simplify working with modular code in the form of subroutines. Let's take a look at how the stack functions in order to get an idea of how it solves these challenges. In this debugging view, we can peer inside the machine while it runs. As usual, the contents of the registers form the CPU's working state, so it's important that we can see what's going on with those. You'll notice that I'm only using four general purpose registers here, instead of the eight that this machine actually has. Everything we discuss will be applicable to any number of registers. We can also see the instruction that we're about to execute in both the currently fictional assembly language and the machine code that it corresponds to. Finally, we have a view into some of the memory that makes up the stack. Notice that this memory is displayed in groups of two bytes instead of single bytes. So each address is separated by two bytes. And as a last small note, I'm using a dollar symbol to indicate a hexadecimal number, which just saves a little bit more space compared with the JavaScript 0x prefix. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, the CPU needs to know where in the stack we are at any given time. So let's introduce a new register for this called the stack pointer. And I'll also add a visual pointer for that value next to the stack so we can get a spatial idea of what this register is telling us. What happens when we execute this instruction? Push the contents of the R1 register onto the stack. Well, what happens is the address FFFE now contains the value that was in the R1 register, 0BAD, and the stack pointer is decremented by 2. Two things of note are happening here. One is that the stack grows upwards. So when we add things to the stack, the stack pointer actually goes down. That's a good thing to keep in mind because that can be pretty tricky. The second is because we pushed two bytes onto the stack, the stack pointer must also change by two bytes. The next instruction is also a push, this time the contents of the R2 register. FFFC now contains the value 1DEA, and the stack pointer is again decremented by 2 and points to the memory address FFFA. After that, the next instruction is a pop R1, which is essentially the opposite of a push. We want to take the last value on the stack and put it inside the R1 register. When we execute, the value we previously pushed, 1DEA, is now in the R1 register, and the stack pointer is incremented by 2. After that, we execute another pop, this time going to the R2 register. And the original value that we pushed from R1, 0BAD, ends up in R2, and the stack pointer is back where it started. Obviously, what we've achieved here is swapping the contents of the two registers, 
but we've done it in a nice abstract way, where we didn't need to think about the intermediate memory that we temporarily made use of. This is in contrast to the last episode, where we used a specific address in memory to store a value in the midterm. Push and pop are the essence of the stack. They give us simple ways of storing values in a first in, last out fashion. But since everything is always a trade off, referring to the specific place in memory that we stored a particular value did get a little bit more difficult. We'd have to perform a calculation on the stack pointer in order to get the address. Not to mention we'd have to keep in mind exactly how many values we'd pushed somehow. But as I said before, there are a few more things that the stack is good for, and a few more instructions that allow us to interact with it. In order to put them in context, let's consider the following piece of assembly code. The main thing that's going on here is we're using the CAL, or call, instruction to call a subroutine named add three numbers that's defined somewhere else in the memory. Its actual position in memory is wherever this add three numbers label ends up being, but it doesn't really matter. It's just somewhere else, and the label will tell us where when we need to know. Subroutines are more or less just functions, and it doesn't hurt to think of them this way. So I will just use those names interchangeably. The first three instructions can be thought of as us supplying arguments to the add three numbers function, one, two, and three respectively. The implication here is that in our architecture, arguments to functions are always pushed onto the stack, but that is not the case in all architectures. This is what's known as the calling convention. The push that happens just before the call is saying how many arguments we're passing to this add three numbers function, which as the name suggests is three. Again, this is not necessarily the same in all architectures, but since it can simplify some things, I've chosen to use it in the LLJS VM. The instructions that come after the call will run after the code of the function has run. This is exactly the same as if you call a function in JavaScript. Any lines that come after that call are executed after that function runs. So what does all this have to do with the stack? Well, even though we don't know how this call instruction actually works right now, let's bring the program into the debugging view and think about how it should. We're seeing the machine not in its starting state, but rather somewhere in the middle of a program where all the registers already have some values. We push one, two, and three to the stack. These are the arguments to the add three numbers function. And then we push the number three indicating the number of arguments that we're passing. In each case, the stack pointer is decremented by two. Then we reach the call instruction. Now, before we execute it, let's think about what should happen here. After this add three numbers subroutine is done running, the machine should be in a predictable state. Ideally, all the registers will still have the same values that they have now, and the stack should be left intact. When executing this instruction, the machine performs some actions that, just for now, we'll think of as a black box. We don't know what the code of add three numbers actually contains. But seeing as we know a little bit about how this machine does work, we know that whatever the add three numbers function is doing, it would at the very least need to use some of the registers in order to add those numbers. And since we've already said that we want to keep the state of the registers intact, how exactly is this state going to be restored? Let's view the state of the machine after this black box subroutine is done. A few things have changed here. Let's go through each of them one by one and build up a picture of what might have happened. First of all, we can see that the stack pointer is now all the way back where it started, even before we pushed any arguments. But those arguments and the number of arguments are still there on the stack. That's because when we pop values off the stack, there's no point in zeroing out the value. We can just move the stack pointer, and then if we push something later, it will simply overwrite. The stack also contains a bunch of extra values now that we definitely didn't explicitly push. If you look closely, you'll notice that the next four values correspond to the four registers R1, R2, R3, and R4. The next stack value after that contains 8DBC, 
which is actually the current value of the instruction pointer. Or, in other words, that value was the return address of this whole subroutine. You're probably wondering where the accumulator register comes in in all of this, since it seems to have a different value. The value it holds now, 6, is actually the return value of the function. It's what we get by adding 1, 2, and 3. So another implication is that when we call subroutines, the return value ends up in the accumulator register. This is also part of the calling convention. An image should now be forming in your mind of how the machine actually restores its state. A data structure is automatically added to the stack when we call a subroutine, a data structure which contains all the registers we need to keep track of. This same structure is later used when we return from a subroutine, using an instruction helpfully named return or ret, and the values inside are popped into the correct registers. We call this data structure a stack frame. But there is a little more going on here. For instance, take a look at the value on the stack which comes immediately after the return address. It's the hexadecimal number 14, which in decimal is 20. If we count the number of bytes from the beginning of the stack up until the return address, and then including the two bytes needed to store this value, we will see that it totals to 20 bytes. This extra piece of information is the size of the stack frame. But why do we need to keep track of the size? Essentially, it's because when it comes to calling and returning from subroutines, the machine is actually implementing a more abstract stack on top of the regular stack mechanics. One where instead of pushing and popping individual values, we're pushing and popping entire data structures. And those data structures can be different sizes. When we call a subroutine, we finalize the stack frame by adding the state of all the registers, along with how big this frame is. Then it's as if we push an entirely new stack frame, which the subroutine begins storing its own values on. If the subroutine happened to call another subroutine, then the same thing would happen again. The state would be saved, we would save the size, and then we would push a new stack frame. It might be worth pausing for a second here to think about whether the machine has enough information when a subroutine returns to actually go ahead and restore that data. The answer is not quite. In our simple stack, we use the stack pointer to keep track of where the head of the stack is right now. But this abstract stack dealing in frames doesn't have an equivalent pointer to know which data structure it's currently keeping track of. For that, we'll introduce another new register called the frame pointer. The frame pointer always points to the beginning of the stack frame. So let's add another corresponding visual pointer to see this spatially. Let's take a look at the state of the machine just before the return instruction is executed inside the add three numbers subroutine. Most of what is happening is still a black box. We don't know what the contents of the registers are, nor do we know what the subroutine has put on the stack or even where the stack pointer is. But what we do know is where the frame pointer will be. It's going to be at FFEA, just above where the previous stack frame ended. This is because the frame pointer is automatically moved when we call a subroutine and it's always moved to just above the old frame. And since we know that, we also know that the size of the previous stack frame is going to be at the address, which is the value of the frame pointer plus two. Likewise, the return address of the function is going to be at the value of the frame pointer plus four. And we can do this for each of the registers because this information is always stored predictably and in the same order. So when we return, it's safe to say that the machine could quite easily grab those values and put them in the correct registers. And since a stack frame only lasts for the lifetime of a subroutine, what we can do is we can set the stack pointer to be equal to the frame pointer plus 14 bytes, which is how many we need to store the size of the previous stack frame and the registers. That means that the stack pointer is now pointing at how many arguments there were.
which can again be used to calculate where the final position of the stack pointer should be. In order to move the frame pointer back to the beginning of the previous stack frame, all we have to do is use the size of the stack frame, which is 20 bytes, and add that to the frame pointer. That will set it correctly back at the start of the previous stack frame. When all of that is complete, the machine has successfully restored the state, got the return value of the function, and is ready to pick up where it left off with the next move instruction, move register to memory. Going back to the trade-offs, which I touched on at the beginning of the episode, we can now see both what advantages and disadvantages we have with a stack. We gain the ability to build up temporary state and an effective mechanism for creating modular code, though this comes at a price. We have to sacrifice some of our instruction space in order to accommodate the specific instructions for interacting with the stack. And we've lost some control over exactly how we save and restore state. It's likely that sometimes you'll write code where, if you call a subroutine, you don't necessarily care about preserving the register, but you have to give up valuable bytes in memory to store them anyway. There are more considerations, of course, but these are some of the primary ones. In the LLJS VM, I believe that the stack provides enough value to be worth it, and so this machine will have one built in. But the decision is informed, because I know what I will give up by making this choice. I really hope you've enjoyed this installment of the Virtual Machine series. In the next episode, we'll create a concrete implementation for the stack. And many thanks to those of you who've chosen to support this channel on Patreon. Knowing that this content is valuable for people is a big motivator to keep going and to keep the quality level as high as possible. If you enjoy this content and you're able, please consider supporting the channel. You'll find links to the Patreon page below in the description, along with all the code for the series and helpful resources for learning more. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.